Awesome, David. So thanks for taking the time, man. Maybe the best place to start, tell me a little bit more about like your journey, both in like sales and now kind of as like an entrepreneur. What sort of inspired yeah. you to, to get started? Uh, so sales, my first ever sales job. Um, I don't know how it works in Australia, but like, you know, what, like a car boot is car boot sales. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the equivalent of like a yard sale in the US. Um, my parents and I like were doing like car boot sales, like whenever they came up, like just getting rid of the stuff that we had knocking about in the house. Uh, and I was probably like, you know, four or five years old. And people bought from the cute kid that knew how to talk to adults, right? So at that point, they were like, oh, wow, he's, he's so good, whatever. And that was like the first entry into like quote unquote sales. Um, then when I was like 15 or 16, I started in like working in like a crappy, uh, I guess like men's clothes shop. So it's like the not so great version of top man in England. Um, so I worked in Burton menswear when I was like 16 years old as like my first retail job. And I took over the sales department there and it, you know, did really well under me running as a 16 year old. Cause I really loved suits. Right. I wanted to be a lawyer. I started watching suits TV show and I was like, oh my God, wow. Like I really like enjoy suits. And like, I got quite into like wearing suits. Like that, right. So I took over the suit department and I realized that a lot of people who were in this retail job didn't understand how the suits should fit. So I kind of took it upon myself when people came in to like tell them that actually, no, they didn't need this size, they needed this size, and they needed to wear this kind of suit for this occasion and all this other stuff. I was like, oh, wow, I've actually got fairly nifty at selling suits at this point. So I went from there into like a mid-market luxury menswear job uh, at a place Thomas Pink. This was, you know, way back probably 10 years ago now, uh, maybe like, like, yeah, like eight or nine years ago now, uh, started selling suits, men's shirts for, you know, like 200, 300 bucks a pop, um, men's suits for like five, seven, eight K. And at that point, like there's no tangible ROI benefit in wearing an eight grand suit versus a 200, 200 quid suit. Right. But when you learn to sell high net worth individuals who have budget and really and truly it's an emotional decision it's like oh wait hang on a minute this goes maybe deeper than i thought it did where it's a retail shop and people buy it because they want it maybe it's about how they actually think about x y and z in front of them so i realized that actually there was there was a knack to this um so i got pretty good at selling men's suits and then from there i've always kind of been the quote unquote sales guy um when i was at uni i got involved with entrepreneurship i started in startups that kind of vibe. I went to the States for a year, did a year in abroad at Emory University. I took an entrepreneurship class there. I took a bunch at Manchester when I went to uni in England. And the difference between those two was massive. In the US, it was way more practical. Um, the, you know, the professor came in on day one of the course and was like, hey, look, we're going to start businesses. You need to come up with an idea for a business by next week, figure it out. And I never to be forgot about this uh, and came up with this stupid idea for like a trash compactor thing that nobody was ever gonna you know basically get involved with and the purpose of the that exercise was okay as a group now like as an individual sorry you need to go and pick what idea you want to work on so i got involved with this app um and was the sales guy for that we had sales coming in before the app was fully functional and i was like okay cool like i actually know how to sell stuff this is clearly the skill that i want to develop so Fast forward at this point, like four or five years, I got into uh, neuromarketing uh, through some guys on Twitter, which is the application of behavioral psychology and neuroscience to marketing. I realized that I could apply it to sales. So I started taking all the stuff that I'd learned from like a 10 year sales career of doing it in luxury retail, regular retail startups, um, being in a consulting environment where people were selling, you know, 250 grand projects. And I applied it all and I was like, okay, how much of this relates to actual legitimate psychology? built out a sales psychology thing we teach to clients and that's kind of where entrepreneurship sales everything else kind of came into it came into the same thing um and then over the last two years i've built an agency we now have a SaaS company as well um so we send we start as a cold legion agency but now the big focus is going into organizations teaching sales side doing legion if they need it but the lead gen is enabled through our SaaS company, which is a cold email sending platform. Um, we hit 10K the first month we launched. So yeah, entrepreneurship kind of has taken various different forms over the period. Sales has kind of come in lots of different forms as well. So I kind of rambled my way through that. But yeah, that's that was yeah, my no, like, whole history in entrepreneurship. No, it's amazing, man. There's, there's a lot in there. Like, I love that. I'm, I'm really curious. Like, so fast forward, like, rewind, sorry, back to where you, you know, mm -hmm. were selling eight thousand dollars or eight thousand pound suits versus 250 pound suits what what was the kind of biggest lesson 
that you learned from, you know, transitioning from selling, you know, the $250 ones to saying like, you know, shit, yeah. these people are buying for 8,000. What was like one lesson from that? Um, challenging a customer gets you further than giving them what they want. The, right. That's, that's the big, that's the big one that I took away from it and, it. and it influences my sales style today. It's the same stuff I teach clients. It's, it's all over the, it's all over the shop. Right. So in reality, if you tell a customer what they want to hear, or you tell a prospect what they want to hear and they're like, okay, cool. Now I, I, I knew I was right. Now you've given them the information that they need to go elsewhere and get exactly what they think is correct. Whereas if you take it the opposite way and you're like, actually, no, you don't need this. You need that. They go, well, hang on a minute. Why? And now they've come to you to be taught differently. And the person who teaches them is the person that's actually going to make them change their mind and the person they trust to actually put through a sale. So I had multiple high net worth individuals who were my clients and they wouldn't go to anyone else because everyone else would just try and sell them the stuff that they asked for. Whereas my response was all would be, why do you, what, what makes you want that versus this? And they're like, well, I don't know. I was like, okay, well, what is it? What is the purpose of it? Like what occasion are you doing it for? So <clears throat> there was a, 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 a story that I kind of explain this best. Um, there was a lady who used to come in. So there was one point where I was working in like the departures part, Heathrow Airport. So you know how like there's a bunch of shops and departures. I was yeah. selling, you know, $300 shirts in the departures area of an airport, right? People don't, logically, you think people don't That's buy sale. that kind of That's expensive clothing. Sale. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there was a lady who came in and she was kind of like pouring around the shop and I kind of looked around at all the other salespeople and no one wanted to go and talk to her because they were like, she's just looking around. She's not going to buy. And I was like, ah, I mean, stand around doing niche. I may as well go over and, and actually see what she wants. So we went over and she was like, oh yeah, I'm just looking like I come through every week and my husband really likes your shirts, but like, you know, I'm probably going to come back next week if I don't find anything and see if there's anything different. And I was like, honestly, don't bother. She was like, what? And I was like, yeah, look, we don't change stock that regularly. So if you come back next week, it's going to be the same stuff. You may as well save yourself a trip and not bother and just go and sit lounge. She was like, why would you tell me that? Like, what happens if I bought next time? And I was like, probably. But the other three times in a month that you come and do this, you're wasting your own time. And I would rather save you the three trips and save me from having to come in and not talk to you because I know you're not going to buy than me telling you to come in every week under the premise that we might change something. And she was like, okay, I respect that. Fair enough. Uh, she back the next week. And she came over and she said, oh, hi, David, blah, 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 blah. I actually do need to buy this for my husband. And I was like, okay, great. And she was like, okay, um, what's the, like, what's the, what's this? What's that? Asked me about a bunch of features of the shirt. And I was like, look, all of that is irrelevant. I was like, why does your husband want this? Like, what is the purpose of it? And he was like, well, we're going for a wedding in this place. I think it was somewhere in, somewhere in Alaska. And I was like, okay, he's going to be hot. Does he get uncomfortable? She was like, he hates wearing it. I was like, okay. If you pick the thing that you were going to pick out, he is going to be sweating through his eyeballs and he's going to hate this shirt. He's never going to wear it again. She was like, okay, so what should I pick instead? Right? That's the teaching element. That's that's the inflection point where she's like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. Tell me. And in that sale, it went from one shirt to four grand worth of kit. Because at that point, she realized, well, hang on a minute. I don't know what I'm buying here. That lady became, every time she came through the airport, which was every week, come in and buy at least one shirt, at least one, buy at least one pair of cufflinks. So this is probably the best dressed man in human history because his wife trusted me that, oh, well, actually, hang on. I can go into David and ask him for this or that or this or that. And he'll tell me something that I didn't know. And at that point, because he pushed her right at the start, told her what she didn't know. And then to actually, you're wrong. Don't think about it like this, think about it like that. She has the ability to trust me now versus anyone else. When I didn't use to work, she never used to come in and buy. And it was like a recurring joke that, oh, this old woman loves coming into David because we don't know what he does, but for some reason she only buys from him. And it was because everyone else was selling what they thought the customer wanted, which is what came out of their mouth, versus what the customer actually wanted, which was to be questioned and find out the motivations behind it. So at that point, I realized a lot of this is psychological. 90% of it is psychological. 10% is logic and people justify the the logic of doing something after they've been emotionally sold or bought into it yeah man and like what you did when she came in there and you you really lowered that sales resistance like you did what most rookie sales people don't do they just go in there and say oh yeah you know what do you want blah 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 and like what you did you really well two things like you built a lot of trust but you took all the pressure away and like you know you literally took the sale away from her where she's like oh well you know you almost disqualified her in a way right yeah, and then she wanted exactly. to kind of come back in so it's i love that man i love that and like on that, like, what would you say is like 
one of the biggest mistakes? Because obviously you, you know, coach a lot of people on sales. What do you think mm-hmm. the biggest mistake most, you know, average or like rookie sales people make? Uh, I think there's two. I think the first one is not disqualifying. Everyone's so desperate for the sale because it's like a dopamine hit in their brain that they feel like they need to sell to everyone, right? You will make more sales and make more money in sales if you disqualify more people than you're probably comfortable with, right? So I have a very direct seller style. Unless I like really get on with you, the likelihood of me like sitting and cracking jokes and being relaxed and whatever is pretty low. I'm going to challenge you the whole time because that's going to get me to people who actually want to buy. We're going to get there faster. My time is valuable. It's more sales calls that I'm missing by wasting time with you. Second thing is when, when you get halfway through a sale and someone's kind of lapping it all up and they're like, yeah, this can 100% help me. Yeah, 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 this is brilliant. I really like the sound of this. Jumping forward to the sale right? Kind of like closing the distance too fast is where you're going to lose a lot of that momentum that, you, that you're that you building. So when you get someone who's like, yeah, really understood, really like this, this is exactly what we need, blah, 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 blah. And then you don't continue doing the same stuff and you jump straight into a pitch, i.e. pitching too early. That's where you lose a ton of people because the reality is they're still not ready. They're saying the stuff that makes you think they are, but you get too keen and jump in for, it, it, it's like going in for a kiss on a date too early exact same logic right you immediately go whoa whoa hang on a minute i wasn't ready for that why are you why are you jumping ahead right and it just turns people off mm-hmm. yeah it definitely does and like follow-up question to that because obviously you know one of the skills in sales is being able to identify the buyer right mm-hmm. so is there circumstances where you will kind of fast track the pitch per se because you know someone's very you know pragmatic they want to get down to the point or do you mm-hmm. you know teach and like preach i guess following that same exact process every single time and never deviating? Follow the same exact process every time. The only thing you are in control of as a salesperson is your ability to run a good sales call. So you start you start winging it and you start going, oh, well, this per- I'm convinced this person's ready to buy and you scrap half the stuff that, that you're meant to be doing. Well, if it doesn't close, what happens then? Mm. Right? The other part of the only time that I deviate from this is is if you're selling a service to an expert who knows a lot about that service, right? So for example, I'm selling um, software development to a massive company that just wants to outsource some part of their software development process. Well, then there's no point in me sitting and doing a protracted sales process. What I'm going to do instead is, okay, how are you going to make this decision? What goes into it? What are the key factors that you're looking at that are going to be big, big boxes tell me that because that's what i care about i don't need to develop a need because we're sat on the phone who as the expert would know whether you actually needed this or not there's no learning or teaching element that is going to cause the inflection point where you come to me and go actually no i do have a problem show me how i can solve it you already know that you've come to me for a solution tell me what you're going to make that decision based on now i can start to sell effectively so it's slightly different but that's the only time i ever say deviate from it okay no that makes sense man that makes sense and David, obviously you've got like, you know, a lot of really cool stuff going on, but like from all your experiences, what's been like the most satisfying moment in business for you? That's a really good question. Um, Mailer E hitting, so Mailer E is our software platform, Mailer E.io. Uh, Mailer E hitting 10K in its first month of trade. That was like pure satisfaction. That was why, why is eight that? months of work. Eight months of work has gone into it. Uh, and we literally did zero marketing. And just from, you know, us building a great product, having a really great team behind it and understanding the exact problems that people were facing in the market meant that, you know, organically we hit 10K in a month and we were like, wow, okay, you actually like this. This is legit. Now, how far can we scale this and how fast can we do it? Yeah, I definitely think like it's one thing hitting 10K, you know, 50K a month in like an agency. But I think with the software, it's kind of, you know, like I've I've dabbled with the thought like in the future of like building a software, which I, I will do by the end of this year, um, specific to what we do. But yeah, it's kind of mm-hmm. like it's a it's a different ball game, right? And I think that's that validation yeah. that you got so quickly. It's like, damn, if we got ten thousand a month with this instantly, like imagine what this can yeah. do long term and like the actual, you know, value of that business will be, you know, pretty crazy in the long term. So that's um yeah, that's awesome, man. Congrats on that. Appreciate and it. In terms of like, you know, marketing, what, what kind of marketing tactics or strategies do you use that, you know, you see as being most effective, most effective in uh, like 2023? Uh, question. Um, I think 
now because of the boom in short form content it's no longer enough just to do short form content i think that wave kind of like was almost like tsunami size over the last you know three to six months with the whole like andrew tate thing blowing up everyone kind of started looking at short form content like wait hang on this person has done this solely through short form content this must be really important. Now it's about longer term brand building using all of the you know weapons at your disposal. So whether it's short form content, whether it's you know stuff like this, like interviews, podcasts, uh, then all of your classic marketing channels, right? If you can have the whole marketing machine with personal brand at the heart of it being an important element. I mean, I think personally, I think PR and and uh, all of the associated industries are going to see a massive surge personally because personal branding is becoming so important. Now, it's not enough just to send a good email because people are going to Google you. They want to see you are an expert in your space. They want to see the fact that you know what you're talking about. And if you are able to do that and you are able to show that more than, you know, competitor number one, you win out. Because I want to go with the person that I trust and I've heard and I've seen speak and, you know, I've thought I've understood their thought process and I really agree with them on X or Y or Z more than just the first person that came in my inbox through a cold email. That's not obviously to say cold email doesn't work. I think it just gets supercharged when you have a solid program. Yeah, definitely, man. It's like the cold email is just the first part because what what do, what do most people do when they get a cold email? They go, oh, that actually is a pretty good email. I might look the person up, right? And so like, I kind of preach that a lot of like, if people search you up and there's nothing in there about you and your company, good luck. Problem. Right. Yeah. hundred like, percent. And I think, I think, yeah, a lot of people are starting to realize that. And I think the core thing from what you said, there's kind of omnipresence, right. Having yeah. that core message, but having it in so many different places that, you know, I've got it's a almost inescapable my... that I can find it. Correct. Yeah. Like one of the emails that I a response to one of the emails I sent recently, the guy's response was like, Hey man, uh, thanks for the email. Went and looked at some of your videos, loved it. Um, let's jump on a call. Right. And so, yeah. It's one of those things as well, because a lot of the time you don't see an immediate ROI on the daily post that you do on the daily videos and all that stuff, but yep. it compounds when you're everywhere. 100%. Like it, um, yeah, it definitely makes a difference. That's for sure. Definitely. Um, cool. And so maybe on like some like closing notes here, like what, what's like a one sentence piece of advice you'd give to someone who's, you know, kind of just getting started on their entrepreneurial journey and is looking yep. to do big things. One piece of advice. Um, so they kind of go hand in hand. So I'll call it one piece of advice, but technically it's definitely two pieces. Um, be everywhere. And as a result of that, like do more. Like you need to be getting on as many sales calls as humanly possible because you need reps in order to sell the thing that you do effectively. You need to be sending more cold emails because that's the quickest way to get, you know, validation for whether your product or service is a thing you need to be creating more short form content so that you are easier to find on the internet all of these things kind of hone around the single point which is do more and be everywhere mm -hmm. i love that man it's great advice